Okay, so I think we're recording. Um, we'll continue to trickle in, but um, I figure we may as well start. Um, so we have a good group of people here. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Isabella, and I'm the YA Curator and Events Coordinator at Buffalo Street Books in Ithaca, coming to you from Chicago until um, I get back <laughs> to Ithaca um, in a week or two. Um, but welcome to the final author event uh, in our Week of YA series. Um, it's been a really <laughs> incredible, if exhausting, uh, week with amazing authors and books that tell all different types of stories. Um, and I couldn't think of a better way to, to close out this week than uh, with the incredible book that is This Is My America by Kim Johnson. Um, I do feel the need to address the passing of, of civil rights icon, Congressman John Lewis. Uh, I shed a lot of tears uh, last night for Congressman Lewis, who was, was also a family friend. Um, and I'd be lying if I said it was difficult to get up in the morning knowing I'd be facing a world without John Lewis in it. Um, but I can't think of a better way to honor him than by celebrating a piece of literature as uh, Congressman Lewis was a huge lover of literature, of, of graphic novels, um, of the written word in general. Um, I can't think of a better way to honor him than by celebrating a piece of literature that, that works to combat the very same issues that he dedicated his life to fighting. Um, so with that, I'm gonna step off my soapbox um, and introduce our co-moderator for this event, fellow Cornellian Anna Leipzig. Uh, Anna is a rising senior at Cornell studying mass incarceration in the United States through the College Scholar Program, um, which is a big deal. Um, at Cornell, she, she ran the Prison Reform and Education Project for three years before um, founding and running the Parole Preparation Project at Cornell, which is an organization that matches people um, sentenced to life in prison with Cornell undergraduates who then help the incarcerated applicants um, prepare for their upcoming parole hearing. Um, and she also works as a tutor for a constitutional law class um, in Auburn Maximum security correctional facility um, and she spent a year doing supplemental mentoring and instruction for youth in Finger Lakes in a Finger Lakes juvenile residential center so I could not think could not have asked for a better moderator than Anna for this event um, and with that um, I'm excited to welcome uh, debut author Kim Johnson today uh, her book this is my America comes out uh, a week from Tuesday I believe uh, and you're definitely going to want to pick up a copy and pre-order a copy. Uh, but Kim, can you introduce yourself and give a quick pitch for the book as I'm guessing a lot of people uh, watching today have not yet read it? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I've, I've been really excited for this just because of all the conversations that I've had with Isabella back and forth um, in, in you know, trying to see if I could participate and then finding out that um, Anna would be someone that we'd be working with. And it actually, it means a lot to me because the work that I do, um, I'm actually a higher ed administrator. I've worked with college students for almost the past 20 years. And so I'm gonna try to control myself and not turn back all the questions to Anna to be like, tell me more about your novels. <laughs> um, so if I, if I lean in too much, I'm gonna really try to control myself because I'm so used to focusing on um, all the just lived experiences of students and, and the amazing things that they're doing and just hearing all that you're involved in. Um, like, you know, John Lewis looks down on people like you who are our next future, who are going to be the change makers, who um, care about issues of justice and equity and want to do something with you, however you pursue, um, you know, your future. So, so thank you for having me. So a little bit about me. I'm assistant vice provost um, at a university in the Pacific Northwest. Um, really, that means that I work with a variety of different advising units that have different kinds of missions to support students. Um, I'm also a director for a center for Multicultural Academic Excellence, uh, which is a unit that has uh, um, Black identified, Latinx identified, Native and Indigenous and Asian Pacific Islander and Desi um, staff who are very focused on supporting the retention and student success of students. Um, my book, This Is My America, um, is a young adult book that really was inspired by, you know, my years of 
educational interests around equity and justice, um, in particular looking at African American history and lived experiences um, throughout society. And it's a book about a 17 year old girl named Tracy Beaumont, whose father has been wrongfully incarcerated and has been sentenced to um, the death sentence um, and he's in his last year and she writes letters to Innocence X which is an organization that I really am giving homage to the Equal Justice Initiative and the Innocence Project um, who help those that have been wrongfully incarcerated uh, to be free or to at least um, have adjustments in their sentences. Um, and it's a book about the criminal justice system. Uh, it's a book about the entire cycle of the criminal justice system. But really, it's about a young girl who saw something that's wrong, it specifically impacted her family. Um, and she goes on a journey to do something about it, which I think goes well in the spirit of, of John Lewis and, and the work that he did. And I think the message that he's given so many people as we look um, at the news and social media, all the lives that he touched um, and inspired and, and said, hey, you know, make, make some good trouble for yourself. Um, and this book is definitely all about making good trouble. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and one of the things that I was just like, can you come to Cornell was like the thing. That <laughs> I was like, I mean, I'm sure we, we I mean, it's, it's a big university. I'm sure we have some people that I'm just like, we need, we need a Kim Johnson. I need to have a Kim Johnson <laughs> at, at Cornell. Um, but I, I want to kick things off by asking you about the writing process for This Is My America. You know, when exactly did the idea come to you? Was it something that had sort of been, you know, stewing in your mind over time? Or was there sort of just like a moment where it just came to you? Um, and, you know, how many drafts did you go through? Did you plot or pants it? Just tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, so um, it, it had been stewing since around late 2014. Um, all throughout 2015 as the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, really took charge as a movement in this country. Um, you know, even before that, you know, we look at um, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, um, Mike Brown, um, which the Ferguson protests were really what sort of finalized sort of the culmination of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and a lot of my students at the university that I, that I work at were heavily involved. Um, I was obviously, um, looking really closely at, at the issues, thinking about my own family um, and, and the ways in which it, 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 it causes me as an African-American or looking at my larger community of, you know, how do you sort of live your life with these worries when at the snap of a moment something can change for you? And that's sort of like that imagery for me about at any moment you don't know where your life could turn. You could think that you're on a great path and then something sort of intersects with that. Um, and so as my students were getting to be really you know, active on these issues, I started to recognize that the media was so focused on just the act of police brutality and the most physical act that you can see at brutality, um, you know, in your face of, you know, mostly black men being murdered, although there are women also, if we look at Breonna Taylor, Sandra Brame, um, issues in terms of their, you know, connection with, um, you know, police enforcement is that it's actually a larger issue. Police brutality is actually only a sliver of the larger issue of our criminal justice system. And um, I started to think about wanting to write a story that took all the interest, the nonfiction that I that I read, I'll read a lot of nonfiction um, on these kinds of issues and, and how that would be if I told a story. Um, it was right around the time also that announcements were coming up for Jason Reynolds' um, All American Boys and Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give. And as I saw those, I sort of took a step back that like, okay, they've got it. You know, I don't need to write a story. There won't be a space for me. I think a lot of black writers, writers of color, um, um, those with intersectional identities feel often that publishing doesn't often have a space to be able to tell, you know, the stories from a lot of different angles, from a lot of different perspectives. Um, and so, um, you know, I took a pause and I was working on another manuscript. And after I read Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, to me, it was the it was told in a way of a narrative that really humanized issues of a population that people have have really forgotten. Um, and have really sort of thought about, you know, if someone is sentenced to death and they obviously did something horrible and we don't really need to sort of think about the, the lives um, of those people. And I wanted to write a story that would be a way for people to open their hearts, their minds, and even see even their advocacy 
to think about, wow, we really need to pay attention to what's going on in our criminal justice system. Um, so I started writing that, you know, um, thinking about it 2015 outlining I actually started writing my first sort of 10,000 words um, right there I'm a pantser mostly a pantser although now that I have an um, agent and a publisher I have realized the the beauty of plotting ahead and <laughs> having a plan <laughs> before you telling a story it reduces the number of revisions that you have to go through um, but at the time I really it was the story that was on my heart um, it was a story that just felt like I was you know, um, experiencing what Tracy was experiencing. And a lot of things were happening in 2016, 2017, 2018, that were not only about Black Lives Matter, but just about, you know, our humanity. Um, who do we want to be as Americans? Um, who do we want to say, you know, is, is the right way for us to live our lives? And looking at um, our own government making decisions that, that to me seemed unjust. Um, and I've always been someone who's looked at things of like, you know, there, we, we, we have to be right, be on the right side of things. Um, and so my heart was just really in this story. And so I've been writing, writing that um, since 2015, really. So, but major, major pantser, <laughs> major pantser. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we want to ask you another question about the writing process. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you navigated research for the book? What legal research did you do and how did you decide how to do it and who to speak with? Yeah, so I um, I love to read nonfiction, um, reading articles, you know, I think it's just a researcher that's sort of like still in me from being a graduate student and, and working on a college campus. So, you know, I think in terms of materials, I probably looked at you know, almost a hundred different kinds of ways that you could you could do research. Um, that's from you know texts, um, you know, looking at you know novels that were novels that were written, whether they were fictional or nonfiction. Um, lots and lots of articles, um, you know, that talk about not only the death penalty but just you know mass incarceration and our criminal justice system, you know, in general. Um, I listen to a lot of stories of people who um, have been wrongfully incarcerated or. Um, because you know, really what I was trying to tell from my story isn't just about wrongfully and in wrongful incarcerations to me that actually just was a mechanism for people just to look at you know how should we actually be treating people regardless of whether they did a crime and there is also just the injustice that often you see this disproportionately impacts those that are black brown and poor in terms of sentencing um, and so you know really listening to stories um, the innocence project um, in different states they're you know they're all across the country um, there's several different states that have uh, podcasts that basically, you know, people tell their story. And that to me was was the way to really sort of dig deep into the issues. Um, my sister is a is a lawyer. She's worked on um, a pro bono death penalty case before. Um, she went to UC Berkeley about law school and they have um, a, a program out there um, that looks at wrongful incarceration um, and support that they do. And so she connected me to also someone who um, spent time as a summer associate uh, working for the Equal Justice um, Initiative uh, with Brian Stevenson in Alabama. And, um, you know, I interviewed him. I, I inter interviewed law enforcement. Um, and so just a lot of different ways. Um, for me, it was a way also just to, to feel like I really understood the story. Um, and understood issues that not only are about criminal justice, but sort of the thread of our entire system. So even looking at Stamp from the beginning in 2015, um, you know, I, I read that and um, Ibram Kendi came to came to my campus and did some teach-ins. And so early on, I've been actually, I've been looking at his work for a really long time. So really it's amazing to sort of see where a lot of the work that I was looking at are, are now books that are on lists that people are buying and hopefully they're reading them, so. Yeah, def definitely. I, I'm, I'm hoping that all these books that are that are being back ordered everywhere are actually are getting read and not just sitting on shelves, but. Yeah, people are still in bookstores, which is something else that I think is, is um, prominent. So there should be a 60 day window and give those books to schools if people don't pick them up. But anyways, I'll, I won't get on my soapbox either. I agree, I agree. Um, <laughs> So I also want to ask you about, uh, in a, uh, you talked a bit about the about the research process, but I mean, I, I loved everything about this book. I am such a fan girl for this book. Um, but uh, one of my other favorite things about it was 
were the characters. Um, I particularly loved the the character of Mr. Jones because he, it was so clear to me that he was just such, he was an homage to Brian Stevenson. Yeah. Uh, and that I just, I thought it was great. And so I, I'm wondering, did you have a favorite character? Do you have a favorite character in this book? Um, and if so, was that your favorite character to write or was maybe that the hardest character to write? Yeah, really good question. I think I float a lot between kind of at the moment of how I'm feeling about which character um, I really enjoyed. I think overall, Tracy, she was my favorite character because um, parts, you know, parts of her are me, um, but most of it, uh, me as a young person, um, but most of it really are my students who are um, very active students, activists, they're student leaders, they're the, the kinds of students who started their or organizations um, because of particular issues, and they just were fearless, relentless, and I wanted that, that kind of energy you know, with Tracy, um, because there's just so many young people that I know that that want to do something. Um, and, you know, they, you know, people treat them like because they're young, that they're not able to, to actually make a difference or do something. Um, and so I really wanted a story that inspired that. So, so she was, you know, um, so fun to write because of so many pieces. And she just was someone I really wanted to be so passionate, where you could, it would just jump off the page, um, even in some of the, you know, probably the scarier things that she did, um, which weren't me, which it was a way of me sort of expressing, um, you know, the kind of things that you want to do, but you're just too scared to do. Um, or yeah, it's just dangerous, don't do it. But um, but that probably was the most fun. But there were lots of different moments that I loved. I loved writing Steve's character. There actually was about 50 pages that I just cut, um, had to cut because one, the book is a, it's a longer book. Um, but it, you know, it was in actually a lot of legal jargon and there was lots of um, case components and there was a lot more research that was in it that I, that I thought was fascinating. Um, but wanting to have a really nice balance of um, still wanting it to be a gripping page turner so that young adults, you know, could, um, could jump into it and it wasn't getting into too much legal jargon and I'm not a lawyer, so I probably would have messed it up anyways. Um, even though, you know, I feel like I'm careful with my research, but still, so that, you know, that's the, the piece that I thought was fun. And then I really enjoyed writing um, Quincy's character. I think that was a, a fun character for me to, um, to be able to write in, in that, that relationship and that dynamic and, 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 and his arc um, in the story that, that people were able to slowly sort of peel away as they got to know him as a character. Yeah, definitely. Um, the characters and just are, are incredible in the way that the um, just how fast you turn the pages, like wanting to know what's going to happen and, you know, like just telling yourself just one more chapter, but then I'll go to bed. No, just, just one more, um, is, was a struggle for me when I was reading it, I was not getting sleep. Um, so as you were writing the book and later as the publication date was announced, I'm sure you could never have predicted that it would coincide with this huge nationwide reckoning about race in America. We were wondering, what are your thoughts on the timing of the release and how, if it has at all affected your plans going forward with your work and your writing? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I, when I wrote my book, um, if you read my book at the back, I, I used some of the resources. I actually read a lot more, but I wanted it to be at least like not completely overwhelming <laughs> for a reader who wants to follow up and read some stuff. Um, but, you know, at the time, I actually thought that my, that my work was too intertwined. It had so many different layers um, that I wasn't sure if there would be an audience for it, to be, to be very honest. I knew that there would be an audience, but I didn't necessarily think it'd be a broad audience. And I was okay with that because I, as an educator, um, I saw it as a book that could be a compliment in, in high school curriculum and maybe replace some very dated classics um, that are on there that talk talk about To Kill a Mockingbird, um, that, 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 you know, can maybe be replaced or, um, you know, a compliment in thinking about how can we actually really focus on, on communities and think about the impacts um, of, you know, not only race, but looking at our um, systems that continue to, um, you know, um, you know, pr provide pr oppression in a lot of different ways. Um, so I think that was, you know, one of the components that, that, you know, I wasn't sure about. And my hope was that, that with my reference list, that people would maybe like, be so gripped into the story, that it would give them like, 
I want to learn more. And that maybe that's just the educator in me is that I would hope that, you know, someone reading would be like, oh my goodness, I want to learn so much more about this particular issue. Um, I never would have imagined the timing um, to be around it. It's, it's not that Black Lives Matter ever stopped being a movement. Um, it just, it just stopped being something, you know, even really around 2015 that people stopped talking about in terms of our, our, our society, obviously not communities that are organizers and thinking about what Black Lives Matter means in terms of specifically our criminal justice system and police brutality. Um, and obviously those, those cases still continued and persisted. Um, I just never imagined that there would be another movement so soon. Um, and there's not very many positive things that I can say about the pandemic. I mean, I think that it's, you know, it's, it's hurting so many people um, in so many different ways. Uh, but what it did do is it caused people to be in their homes, um, in spaces where they can actually stop and pay attention to something that's been going on for hundreds of years. Um, and, you know, with my story, I always felt when I was writing my story that, that, that there was something else sort of pushing me to write this story. Um, I've always been sort of a purpose-driven person um, and felt like I, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a purpose that I'm doing the things that I'm doing. And when I was writing, I really felt, I felt that. And when I would question myself, whether I'd, I'd write something in the book and I'd question myself, would anyone actually believe that what I'm writing is true? Would anyone believe that this still happens? And then something would happen on the news, um, specifically around thinking about white supremacy and the boldness of it that just, you know, seems to get louder and louder and, and almost more okay. Like it's almost accepted um, on the guise of like, well, we don't want to get political about these issues or freedom of speech. Um, when as a country, we should be stomping, stomping this down. We should say that this is not the place that this can happen. Um, and so in terms of the timing, it's, it's painful because I think as, you know, a, a, a Black person who's been aware of these issues, um, that it shouldn't take what it took, you know, in a, you know, a 10-day window where there was sort of this like back-to-back -back sort of very visible way of, of racism and, and obviously how horrific um, the video was for George Floyd. Um, but, you know, th that happens with movements and it's, it's a bloody history of our country. If we look at Emmett Till, um, the sacrifice that his mother made um, to have her son be, um, be a, a vehicle of a message in, a, in, in the most brutal way that we could sort of see what our country is made of, um, unfortunately, it's those mo moments that have proven to be the way in which you spark the hearts and minds of people um, to want to do something. And I see this as a big moment. This, this time it is different. Um, this time there are enough people engaged across the country. And I think for my book, there are more readers. Um, and there are more people who, you know, I believe will have read some of their resources so that when they're coming into the story, um, they are coming in with maybe a little bit more information. And if they're not, that it might continue to be something that, that people talk about. And so for me, then I know that I had a purpose writing it, um, as sad as it, as it, as it was with everything that's going on. Um, that is my mark as a literary activist that was my my mark that story um this is my america is is my moment as part of a larger movement so and and i'm gonna you know accept that as it as it is thank you you spoke a little bit about you know what you chose the story you chose to tell and how you would hope it would resonate with readers and you mentioned the innocent story earlier on um and one thing we wanted to talk to you about is um how even though you have this storyline focused on innocence, you have these supporting storylines like Tasha's father of characters who were incarcerated and, and weren't innocent. And we wanted to know what was the driving decision behind putting innocence as the center of the storyline and whether you see any upcoming projects that might focus on this topic of criminal justice reform, but from other angles. Yeah, it was really important to me to have that broad representation. Um, you know, I use the the mechanism of of someone who was innocent, 
someone who, you know, when we think about our, our death penalty, our sentencing, um, that should be, if we're, if we're going to sentence someone to death, we should be 100% sure that that person is, that means that they should have the entire, you know, support of an investigator. They should have the best lawyers possible. Um, so to me, it was sort of this like crack that I wanted to create to sort of, you know, um, showcase our criminal justice system is if that we can actually make errors and they estimate that, you know, one in nine people who are on death row actually are innocent. Um, if we can allow the murder of somebody, and I call it a murder, I call all of them actually, they are murders by the state, um, is that, that there's gotta be so many different ways in which our justice system is actually broken. Um, you know, I also, you know, hope that it would be a window where people who haven't read Just Mercy and Brian Stevenson would then actually also open in their hearts to question whether or not we should even have the death penalty at all, because is that justice? Where is rehabilitation? Um, you know, is it really an eye for an eye? Is, is that, is that what, what kind of country we want to be? Um, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to tackle that because again, when you sort of get, you know, too into, you know, that kind of issue, then people will, will turn off and want, not want to necessarily read it. But if you tell someone that someone is innocent, like that's when you can imagine, oh my goodness, what, you know, what went wrong there? Um, but that's not all I wanted to talk about. I, it was sort of like this entire cycle I wanted to show from Jamal, um, who is Tracy's older brother, um, who you know saw what happened in his life with his father, how he was innocent, how there were witnesses that were there, um, you know, who who said he was in a different location, and he still, you know, was 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 sentenced, found guilty. Um, that he worried about what his experience was like. And I wanted to be able to show what, what, what that kind of investigation could look like that could lead a community to believe. I wanted to show media. I thought it was really important to show the ways in which telling a story can slant where you're, you're focused on the victim, which I think is so important. I don't think you should never forget the victim, but you forget about often black, brown and poor people who are also the victim because they're um, accused of something that they may or may not have necessarily done. Um, you know, a, a, a really important book that I, that I like to reference a lot that I think is such a good storytelling for people to think about is um, by Wes Moore, The Other Wes Moore. Um, it's a story about, you know, um, two men with the same name in the same community who had very different lives. Um, and I wanted to give homage to that in my story by telling, the story of different characters who had different ways in which that they experienced life on circumstance. Um, so I, ha I have a, a character who is Tasha. Um, her name is Tasha. Her she's Tracy's best friend. Her her father. She calls him Daddy Greg. Um, he he was sentenced. He did he did something. Um, and he, you know, had spent time in prison. He had came out. It was difficult for him to 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 be out. He, um, you know you know, uh, did something with, with his sort of like to break his probation period and had to go back inside for about three years. And then he came out. Um, and I really wanted to showcase how difficult that is for a family, um, how that can, you know, connect to a family. And I wanted to at least, you know, give, give reference recognition of our rehabilitation process and what that looks like. And hopefully the story just in general had people question about sentencing. And I, and I talk a little bit about it in my author's note about some of the injustice and disproportionate sentencing that happens by race. Um, but I really wanted to leave those question points so that it wouldn't just be a story about someone who was wrongfully incarcerated, that it's, it was more than that. So... And there might have been a last part, but I kind of, I talked too long that I forgot maybe the last part that you asked me. <laughs> so. I was wondering if you might in the future wow. look at this topic from another angle other than innocence. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I haven't necessarily thought about that. I'm very interested in telling stories about the generational impact of, of slavery um, and, and how that sort of put us to today. So I like to take different ways in which our legal system has um, disproportionately impacted the African-American community. And so I'm, I'm tackling a different angle in a different, in a different way, but still around um, systemic racism 
Better Society for our next book, um, you know, but I think as I hear from more readers, you know, that always sparks another story about, you know, wanting to tell. And there's been some really great works um, from, from people who have, who have done, told from that, that story, but I don't think there's been a lot necessarily in, in young adult and maybe, yeah, maybe haven't thought about that specifically though. Thank you. So I want to go back a little bit to um, you're talking a little bit about where you wanted sort of where about the place that you wanted this book to be. Um, and I was struck by something um, that the author Jason Reynolds said about books, and that is that books are wonderful uh, places to start conversations about uh, important issues such as race, but if they are not accompanied by a conversation, which in turn leads to action, all they do is create a safe space for people to engage with these issue issues, like, you know, a safe space for people to be embarrassed or ashamed about, you know, things such as their own ignorance. Um, and as a result, um, with not going beyond the safe space results in us not creating a safer world. Um, so I'm wondering what conversations do you want your readers to be having after, you, after reading your book and what kinds of actions do you want to see them taking as a result? Yeah, I mean, I think I planted a lot of seeds of ways in which you can take action um, from, you know, I think I use the model of Tracy running, she runs Know Your Rights workshops in the stories, uh, in the story. And um, that just was one example of something that someone can do on their own. And it doesn't have to be that, right? It can really be anything that if you see a problem that you can do something. Um, the example, she writes a letter is to Innocence X. And I, and I wanted to have those moments throughout the story where you, you could see, you know, some of the letters that she wrote, because I think that, um, Right now, there's a need for us to change our uh, po policies and our laws. Um, and how we do that is we do that through voting. We do that through advocacy. We do that through holding those that are in particular positions accountable and putting pressure on them. That's what protests are doing right now. It's causing a disruption. Um, and people don't like disruptions. And so people want disruptions to stop. Um, and how you do that is then you get them to pay attention to, to what you want. Um, and so for me, um, I do want there to be a conversation. Uh, I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's been difficult for, you know, a lot of people, and I'm, I'm talking mostly about white people who feel uncomfortable talking about race. I talk about race every day. I have to navigate um, who I am, how I live, my safety, my children, how they, how they, you know, experience their teachers, going to a doctor, going to the grocery store, um, going to a meeting, um, you know, that I'm at, that I'm, I'm, I'm constantly facing these interactions about people questioning who I am and what purpose do I serve or what role I, that I'm in. Um, it's uncomfortable. And, but it's a part of my life and I've had to find a way to live in it. And I do, I think now all of America needs to become uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to provide safe spaces, you know, so people can feel like they can express themselves. But I think that often people think about safe spaces as um, people, you don't get to, you don't get to sort of like, you know, get pushed back on, right? So, you know, you can, you can talk about something, but people are, should still continue to engage, you know, regardless of it upsets you that someone tells you that actually something that you're holding and believing is racist, but that doesn't mean that we don't get to stop talking about it because it made you upset, um, because that's not how change happens. And so, you know, I hope that it just, it just gets people more aware, um, for me, it's a call to action. So this is my, for me, it's a call to action. I, I hope that it like really gets people who are really starting to pay attention to this stuff. And it just makes them think about like, I want to do something, you know, how can I, how can I go out there and do something? And then those that, you know, it sort of might open them. I, I, you know, I wrote it in my, you know, author's note is that I don't want it to be something that someone just kind of closes the book and it's like, oh, that was a good book, or oh, that was fascinating. Um, I want, I want something more than that, and I hope that it draws more from that. Um, but we have to be able to have these conversations. The other last thing, and I, just talking specifically about one of the characters that I wrote in the book um, was Dean, um, who is a friend of Tracy's, a longtime friend of Tracy's. He's white. Um, 
and he's a good friend of hers. Um, and, you know, he needed to engage and understand some racism that he sort of holds in. And he wasn't a bad guy because of it. You know, it wasn't like he was a bad guy, but, you know, that relationship with Tracy to me, I wanted to have a model of, you know, Tracy could hold him to, you know, a standard to say, yeah, you're going to have to deal with that on your own. That's not, you know, like that this is, this is my life. You have to deal with it on your own. And I'm hoping that he's a model of, you know, people who want to be able to do better, who can talk to their parents, talk to family members who are holding racist beliefs that it's their responsibility to do that. I can't do that. I, you know, I, it shouldn't just have to be the people who are impacted. If you know something is wrong, that's the only way that you're going to make change. And so I hope that people are continuing to have tough conversations with people who they love and care about. Um, so. On that topic of who you want to be reading your books and what you want to happen from that, um, if you could put This Is My America into the hands of some famous people you admire, uh, who would they be? And additionally, if you could pick a maybe famous or influential person or anyone who demonstrates a need to be educated on this topic, <laughs> read your book. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would love Ava DuVernay to have have this book. Um, she's she's to me she is a artist activist. Um, I'd love for her to have this book. I love Brian Stevenson obviously um, because he just inspired so much of my writing. Um, you know, so I think that they would be the 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 two people that I for sure would really, you know, want to read my book and hopefully they would like it. Um, <laughs> um, who I want to read it? Oh goodness, it's so. I mean, like our entire and, and our entire government. Um, <laughs> I would like them to to read it. Um, Honestly, though, in terms of being able to actually make impact, I think I wouldn't even look necessarily at, at influential leaders. I think that there's, uh, those are very, there's so much other evidence that's, that's been there and put in people's faces and they, you know, for whatever reason have, have decided to um, take a certain path on their beliefs. So I really would love teachers. Um, teachers are the ones that are shaping the minds of young people in a lot of ways. Um, and there needs to be a lot of, of work and openness to understand bias in the school to prison pipeline um, that actually sets the trajectory to a lot of the criminal justice issues that we see. It happens at a very young age um, from as early as preschool. You see the ways in which um, thinking about behavior, um, thinking about um, right and wrong and who has the ability and who gets love and attention. So I'd love, I'd love it to get it to, I'd love to get it to teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I hope lots of teachers will read this too, and I'll definitely be recommending it to the teachers who come into the store. Um, but, uh, one thing that, that really got me, um, is at least it's on the, it's on the back of the arc, but, um, it's, uh, that the book is sort of pitched with a line, uh, and that is the idea that we live in a country in which the color of your skin can determine who gets stars and who gets stripes. And I think that really ties into the title of the book um, and the idea that, you know, we may be the United States, but we are not one America. Um, can you talk about the significance of the word my in the title and mm -hmm. the reality that America means different things to, to different people often because of the color of our skin? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Um, you know, Langston Hughes has a poem that says it's called I Too from America. Um, and, you know, it's it's been a long question for a very long time. You could look at W.E.B. Du Bois, who talks about the double consciousness, um, the sort of having to navigate uh, you know, navigate your life as, as someone who's African American. And I think obviously there's a lot of other um, communities in, in our, in, you know, in our country and identities um, that have to sort of navigate, um, navigate their identities in, in different ways. And um, I, I really wanted that emphasis on the my, and specifically thinking about Black America. That, that's, that's really what I was saying there, is that Tracy's experience, 
you know, being, you know, a, a black young woman, how that impacts her family, um, wanting people to pay attention to it. You know, I, I, I think I, would, I was thinking about the flag a lot. So there's a lot of symbolism with the flag, stripes and star, who gets stripes, who gets stars, right? Um, or who gets, who gets bars. It still is sort of this lining of thinking about the flag, even the imagery on the cover with, with her hair. Um, you know, all of those are really symbolic of thinking about um, our America. And um, the flag is a really interesting thing for me um, because you know, there is this continued question, I think, for anyone who critiques America that they don't love America. There's this sort of rhetoric that happens that if you critique America to, um, to look at how are we upholding who we say that we are versus what we are and what we have been, um, there's this sense of like, go elsewhere, right? Go, well, go back to Africa or go wherever you're from or go live somewhere else because if you've got so many issues with America. Um, even about, you know, when I see the flag, the flag, you know, I believe in America, you know, I believe in, in us being the best country that we are, but the flag has been taken from all of America. It's been taken as this, when you see it sometimes in communities, um, it actually causes fear because there's this sort of, it almost can be symbolic with the Confederate flag in terms of the holding of a flag. When I see a flag, even though I feel like the flag is still supposed to represent me, um, there are too many instances where we see the flag and it sends a message, whether people wanna believe it or not, it sends a signal um, to at least my community about, do I need to be fearful that this person holds some, you know, racist belief to me in sort of claiming that the flag is like sort of their thing. And this is for non-military folks. I mean, I think obviously that there are, you know, people who are um, in the military and, and hold that. Um, and we saw it with Colin Kaepernick when he was uh, peacefully kneeling, right? I mean, I mean, can you just, you know, just even looking back at everything that we're going on, um, he just wanted people to pay attention. I want you to recognize I I'm using my power right now um, to demonstrate that there is an issue happening that's impacting Black Americans in this country and they are dying and no one is paying attention to them. Um, so I will use my power to kneel, simply kneel. Um, at the flag, you know, not spit on the flag, not burn the flag, um, you know, not do obscenities, but just simply kneel. Um, and that was something that was on my mind a lot in thinking about it. So uh, that's my long-winded way <laughs> of telling you um, why I really wanted to emphasize telling a story about, uh, you know, about a young girl and, and calling it, this is my America. So. Yeah, and I, I just want to say that your, your explanation about the flag, I mean, it's something that, you know, me as someone who is Black, like, I had never, I have the same feeling about, about the flag, and I would never have been able to put it into words why sometimes seeing people with, like, their giant sort of, whether it's in, you know, sort of, I don't know, a barnyard that has that has it painted on there or just you know a big flag whether it's on twitter or in person like there's something about it that sometimes makes me uncomfortable and it's it's interesting to sort of to figure out to to sort of to come to this realization as well that that there is a reason for that it's not just it's not just me um mm -hmm. um but with that being said i want to move into some questions about sort of more publishing aimed questions um and then we'll open it up to, to you all. So if you'd like to start putting questions into the chat, um, that'd be wonderful. Um, and then if we have time, you can sort of go back to some of some other questions because I'm sure Anna and I have endless questions. Um, but the uh, one thing that I do want to ask you is that sort of during this nationwide, you know, rebellion about things such as police brutality, we have seen uprising with regards to the publishing industry as well, and particularly with conversations um, that stem from initiatives such as, you know, hashtag Black Out Bestseller List and revelations such as hashtag Publishing Paid Me. Um, Black Out Bestseller List, for those of you who may not be familiar, was uh, an initiative to for during a particular week to get everyone who was able to buy at least two books by Black authors in an effort to sort of black out the, the publishing, uh, the New York Times bestseller list with books uh, by Black authors. And then publishing paid me was um, 
an initiative that was showing the discrepancies and advances between uh, black authors and white authors. Um, but you had a wonderful conversation with the author Nick Stone, um, another one of my most <laughs> favorite authors um, in Entertainment Weekly. And by the way, that issue is out now. You can get, I think, Robert Pattinson's on the cover. It's over there, but um, <laughs> pick it up. It has a wonderful article in there. Um, but you said something that really resonated with me, and that is about how when this book was on submission, uh, an editor said she was going to pass because it wasn't going to be as big as the hey you give, in her, in her opinion. Um, and you said, and I, and I quote, uh, can you imagine that the biggest top selling book that sold millions of copies is the standard for a black writer? Is that the expectation that will always be held for a black writer? Um, and that just really stood out to me and really resonated with me. And, and I'm wondering, are you hopeful that these conversations, these sort of initiatives that have been taking place and uh, the conversations that we're currently having about the publishing, publishing industry will lead to, to real change? Yeah, powerful question. Lots of lots of ways I could go um, tackle it. Um, I think it will move the needle. I don't know how it's it's you know it's to me it's like higher ed. So you know, working in higher ed, it's a sort of ivory tower. Um, it is systems and structures that have been there for a very long time. They're very hard to move. I think that publishing um, is very similar. Um, there are some advantages that I think, you know, can help move things forward is one, we're all learning that we actually can do our work remotely, which has been one of the reasons why publishing hasn't changed a lot because a majority of what occurs in publishing happens on the East Coast. It happens in New York. Um, and to be able to live and survive and, and, and do well and have a salary for what those that actually work in publishing, um, it is a hierarchy structure that you actually start, you know, at the very bottom, um, you know, it's very difficult to act, to live, as you know, as you know, um, to live to live in in New York, and so you have an industry that um, has very little underrepresented. Um, populations actually working in it so that's from the sales and marketing that's from the the head you know, head of editors, even the representation of editors. Um, so when you're in an acquisition room that is a majority white. Um, you know, there already are those forms of bias. And so even when you have underrepresented, you know, staff who are in there vying for particular books, often they're one voice and you have to kind of measure yourself about how many do I want to be the one who's always having to say that we need to do this thing? Because if you do, then people stop listening to you because they already know exactly what you're going to say. And so I think um, we're, we are already witnessing some changes with, um, Lisa Lucas, who um, who is the head of the National Book Foundation, is now going to be um, senior vice president for um, Pantheon um, Pantheon Books. Um, and, you know, another head of Simon and Schuster. So um, it needs to happen at the top because the kind of influence that you can have in terms of who you hire next policies and those kinds of things change. Um, there is a call for transparency with. Um, you know, with salaries. For me, you know, the conversations that I'm going to be having with my agent is that, you know, my agent within her, you know, industry, she has access to information to know about how, um, how deals are made. And if I'm, if, you know, am I getting a, a proportionate kind of deal that's similar to other, other people? Um, my expectation and my hope for publishing is that they actually have all that data. We did, there was a survey as part of the hashtag publishing paid me where they've collected around 2000 um, self-reported deals on the amount of announcements that they, you know, that, what they've got in their deal. Um, that's one way, but it's very difficult to sort of parse that. Um, but the publishers, they have the information. They have all that data. They know exactly what their advances are. They know what comps that they use for those. Um, and, and that's my expectation, but it's still, it, it'll move the needle, but it's not going to be, you know, as, as significant. Um, and people need to really pay attention to it. So, you know, I have a, I have this sort of challenge with, 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 with my work right now. Um, especially as a as an advocate um, for the representation of, of black books by black authors uh, is that I want to I, you know I want black 
writers to feel that they, whatever topic that they want to write about, that there's a space for them. Um, and, and often, which I think is a complaint by many Black authors who write fantasy or love stories or, you know, other kinds of, of works that aren't necessarily about, you know, racism, that they feel like that no one cares about them. Um, and for me, it's really challenging because I think that racism is our biggest sin that needs to be addressed. Um, and I want to write about it because I have always been very interested in, you know, ethnic studies and what the issues in our community. And I think it's so important. Um, but I also know how important it is to read about joy. And for my kids, when I'm buying all these books, because I am buying every single one of them that's coming out by a Black author, is that I want the books for them to hold. Um, I don't know if my daughter's watching right now, but you know she's six and um, she's looking at Cinderella is Dead and she's looking at A Song Below Water. She's looking at A Song of Wraith and Runes. Um, you know, she's seeing these um, books that are in her in her home and she wants to read them because they are pictures of beautiful black girls in front of her um you know getting my son books um from the front desk of zoe washington a good trouble um shuri um tristan strong all of these books i want them all for my son i get them all for my son so because i want to write about my issues i still need to do my my advocacy um in that work i also don't want to be tied because i wrote about a particular book that i'll necessarily always want to write stories i know a lot of my stories will be because i i that's just like my my passion areas my advocacy it's the, the organizer in me um it's the person who wants to make change but um sometimes i might want to write a love story too or write a book that has magic in it um and i should be able to do it so yeah definitely i'd, I'd read anything you write <laughs> but <laughs> To, uh, you, you spoke a little bit about some of the books that are behind me, actually, but um, I'd love to hear some recommendations from you. I have a, a few different questions uh, pertaining to different recommendations. Um, but the first one is the vast majority of us have been in quarantine for three, four months. Um, and, you know, for some, it was difficult to, to sort of, I mean, stir up the energy to, to read. But uh, for others, it was, you know, reading 10 books a week. Um, so did you read anything during quarantine that you really liked and that you would recommend? Yeah, I said a lot of them when I talked about the YA. So I, I mostly read YA and I get middle grade and other kinds of things for um, for my son. Um, so A Song Below Water um, is is a great one. And I have it by I have it by my side too. I loved You Should See Me in a Crown. So I'll I'll bring it. I so I loved You Should See Me in a Crown. Um, it's a, a amazing story. It, it's like I feel like I wish I would have had it when I was in high school. Um, such a great story. There's lots of different, so Dear Justice is gonna be coming out. This is my arc, I got the arc of it. Dear Justice is coming out. I think for those that want to read more about um, uh, juvenile justice system. So that's the follow-up to um, Dear Martin. I'm trying to look at all my books. Um, so I've been reading a ton of 2020 YA debuts, especially black authors. Um, just you know making sure to support them i'm going to be starting um the black kids by christina hammond reeves um she debuts a week after i do um so i'm going to start that um very very soon i'm reading a 2021 um book that's coming out um because i'm looking at you know if i want to blurb it um uh, so i'm kind of reading a lot of that kind of stuff um but like my recommendations i just got survival math um you know, this is a, a nonfiction story by Mitchell S. Jackson, um, a book that I'm absolutely loving as, as as a fan of James Baldwin. And I think this is the book of our times is Begin Again by Eddie Glaude Jr. Um, it's a book that talks a lot about James Baldwin. James Baldwin is probably the book that I'm reading the most right now, anything, all of his works. Um, because he is so timely with all the issues that are going on. He continues to be timely. And that's um, definitely what I recommend. But lots of YA um, <laughs> that I'm reading a lot. I'm reading, I should actually, I should be reading because I need to be writing. That I need to be writing my second book. But um, I am doing lots of, of reading. And I hope by mid-August that I'll take a break actually for a couple months of not actually reading because I need to um, I need to focus my energy on, on my work. So yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, we, we had... Um, earlier events this week with Roseanne Brown and um, um, <laughs> Kaylin, Kaylin, Kaylin Barron. And yeah. Kaylin. <laughs> yeah. Um, but both of them are so fantastic. Um, and we, uh, I don't think I posted the 
uh, Caitlin Barron's event yet because you know, footage, I need to mess around with some other footage, but you do have recordings of that. So you guys can uh, watch that later if you missed it. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of great books have come out recently and I'm, and I'm really excited for that. Um, and I'm just to ask you for someone who, who read, uh, for a reader who would read, you know, uh, this is my America and just absolutely loves it. Uh, would you say like maybe the next book that they pick up be, you know, Dear Martin or Dear Justice? Um, yeah, I, um, I haven't read it yet, but I have high hopes. And I think Isabella, you've read it, but I have it now. I have the arc of um, Punching the Air by E.B. Zaboa and um, Yusef Salem. Um, and it's uh, a novel in verse. Um, it's a beautiful, it's, it just, I just know it's going to be amazing. Um, so that's actually the, the book that I would pick up next. So people haven't read Just Mercy. I think that that is a read that should be in every household. Um, it's such has a core of humanity that people need to read and have in their house. Um, so I definitely would read that. But in terms of like, um, you know, YA, if you haven't read um, Dear Martin, you know, I think that that's a, a Dear Martin, Tyler Johnson was here, Anger is a Gift. Um, those are all, you know, stories that that, that deal with um, some act of, aspect of either police brutality or our criminal justice system. And then I've got a million nonfiction books that I could tell you about, but you probably don't want to hear all of that. <laughs> yeah, nonfiction is great. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, there's, one question in here that I'm gonna have Anna ask, uh, but there's uh, just a note in here that I think is lovely that I wanna read. Uh, it says, hi, teacher here, no question, but I just wanted to thank you for this work. It was extremely relevant and a beautiful mm -hmm. story. I definitely agree that it could replace or complement texts in our, in our curriculum, especially American literature, which is what I teach. Thank you for adding to the field of literature and education. This is American literature. And thank you. Um, and then the next, uh, chat is a question for you. Um, Ms. Johnson, I'm so moved by your narrative. Listening to you is very inspiring. I'm a middle school teacher who teaches at the UN International School and wrote a curriculum on the civil rights movement. It is the only time in middle school that the students are taught about this movement. Hopefully this will be changing. Given the latest developments with Black Lives Matter, would your book be appropriate for fifth graders? It's, um, to probably too young for fifth graders. Um, it is aged at 12 and older, so a little bit higher middle school you could read it, although it is YA, so typical YA is about 13 and older. Um, but, you know, for a fifth grader, I would say I just got my son a good kind of trouble. I think that that's um, by Lisa Rames. Oh, I, I mess up her name, um, but it's got a, a girl on the cover with a backpack on in a little Black Lives Matter sign on the backpack. I, it's, and it's about sort of a young girl observing that her sister is involved in activism and sort of trying to understand that. So I think that that's an, a nice contemporary one to read. Um, from the front desk of Zoe Washington, I do think, by Janae Marks, I do think that a fifth grader could read that. It has a story about a young girl who, um, finds out about her her father and um and I think it's 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 soft and sweet um and she bakes up lots of cupcakes um and she goes on her own adventure trying to actually um um prove her her father's innocence and I think that is actually a really great book for a fifth grader totally approachable um you know on those kinds of issues um and then I think at the fifth grade level the the mind is so impressionable at that time sometimes it's hard to talk about these sort of issues, I actually think that there are so many exciting um, fantasy, um, you know, stories that are just, that, that have Black characters who are, who are doing amazing things and they're on their own journey. And I would say that though, I would fill, fill your young people with those kind of books because they don't get to see it. And this is the first sort of time that I have ever seen so many amazing books that are at that age. Um, the other book, actually another book, The South of Home, um, by Karen Strong. That's a middle middle grade book. It do, it de deals with heavier issues, but it's it's for middle grade readers. That that could be good for a fifth grader. But I would say, fill your fifth graders with a lot of empowering black main characters, so that you know that that they all see that it's possible, and that you know even if you, if you're not a, a black student in a class that they actually get to see you know people doing these amazing things and i would love i would love for for teachers especially at that age to fill fill the minds of their young people with with these um powerful stories that just have not had any representation 
thank you for that. Both of both of the teachers that I'm so glad that there were teachers here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just want to jump in. Uh, I have a recommendation for that one as well, and that is Ghost Boys by Oh Ghost Boys, Parker. Jewel Parker Oaks. Yeah, Parker. it's it's right in. I think it's target to mm -hmm. eight, ages eight to 12. Um, it's also, it, it broke my heart. It made me sob, um, but it, it's targeted at that age. And it's a really good opening point to start those conversations. Um, and uh, uh, Lisa, our manager and I, we did a little uh, community talk where we recommended books. And one of the things that I said about this book is it was something that I would love to see parents read with their children. Um, and so I think that it's especially good to be in a classroom setting for, for kids to discuss it with their peers. Um, and it's a really great way also to, to introduce uh, kids of that age to the figure that is Emmett Till. Um, uh, it's about a boy who um, who is shot and killed by He's basically very similar to the case of Tamir Rice, but he becomes a ghost uh, and meets another um, another ghost boy who happens to be Emmett Till, who helps him make sense of the historical racism that led to the end of to the end of his own life, uh, to both of their lives. Um, but yeah, all those recommendations are are absolutely fantastic. Um, and that's a that's a great. I I like co-sign that recommendation. The other thing that's really amazing about that book too is that if you go to Jill Parker Rhodes' website, she actually has an eighty-page discussion guide on how teachers can actually teach this book. So like it's all ready for you. So <laughs> you just have to read it and then pick up the discussion guide. But that's a very very extensive um, resources. So that I think is a is an amazing book to to use. So. I'm so glad you said that, Isabel. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, do, Anna, do you want to take the question? Um, thank you for this talk. You talk a lot about being inspired by your students' civic engagement. How has being disconnected from them during this quarantine period impacted your writing inspiration or your general fulfillment as an activist? Yeah, I think it's it's hard to be away from my students um, where they're not visible. There's a, there's a small uh, group that I'm an advisor for. There's about nine young black women who are in that group. Um, and I'm able to, I still do Zoom calls with them and just texting, checking in with them, which I typically, I don't text my students, but this for this particular group, um, I, I do in terms of my mentorship role with them. And that's really hard. A lot of my work that we're still serving students. And so I find a lot of fulfillment in making sure that my students on my campus have have access to advisors and that we're removing barriers. And so for me, I still feel like a fulfillment that like now more than ever, because we're not able to have that human to human connection that or I'm able to do it. Um, and in the summer, it typically gets quieter. So it almost feels normal in, in a way, because usually lots of activism is occurring and they're, they're going to meetings and they're having their sort of like organization stuff happening. Um, but then when the summer hits, it's quieter. So I think the fall, the fall is going to hit me really hard because as an administrator, I absolutely love the fall because all of my new freshmen and all of my new transfer students, they're on campus and my office space is flooded with hundred students in line who are so confused. They don't know what, they don't know what they're doing <laughs> or where they're supposed to go. <laughs> um, and I, and I, and I, you know, I really am going to miss that because that's usually for me, especially as an administrator, I support all students. But like when I see a new black student, especially, and I, and I don't know who they are, um, and I get to meet them and then see them on their journey and get them connected. Um, I, I'm going to miss that. I'm not going to be able to have that. I'm not going to meet those new students in that way. Um, so that's really sad for me. But, um, but, you know, I think young people, they always find a new way. And so I just have to try to keep up so hard. But I just have to try to find out whatever new thing that they're, whatever new technology. I don't know. I can't, I can't keep up. By the time I'm on TikTok, they'll be on something else. So I'm just... <laughs> I'll stick to Zoom. <laughs> Alrighty, uh, looks like we've, um, this was such a great conversation. Um, can I can't thank you enough for being here today and for discussing this this book with us because it, it really is something incredibly special. Uh, and I can't and I can't wait to be back uh, in the store and physically able to like thrust it into people's hands and to, to put it on my my shelf or our, our staff recommends because it's just it's an incredible book um and it comes out uh july 28th I, july 28th yep 
July 28th. So a week from Tuesday. Um, so if you haven't already, please, please pre-order it. Uh, Pre-orders are so, so important uh, for, for authors and for a book success as well as um, week of sales. Um, and uh, if you want to take advantage of it for all of the books that we featured this week, uh, you can check out our website, um, buffalostreetbooks.com. If you want to order them all, uh, you can get a 15% discount. Um, but there are great books, so um, I recommend reading them all. Um, but especially This Is My America. Um, it's just, it's a really special book um, with a really special message. Um, and it's it's great for classrooms. It's great for reading for pleasure, uh, for your for your kid who doesn't like to read, and you're like you need to read a book now. This is one <laughs> that will that um, will teach them something while also getting them excited about reading. Um, Anna, do you want to say anything here? So much. Um, the book, as I echo everything that Isabella said, it was fantastic. And I know for me. Um, I interact with a lot of incarcerated people with children and grandchildren. And I think this is such an amazing book for those kind of families to have access to that tell their own story. And I'm very excited to recommend it to those families going forward. Thank you. Thank you everyone for, for tuning in. Um, and again, it comes out July 28th, so you don't have to wait too long to pick it up. Um, but when it does, I hope that you all will. Um, and I think that about does it for today. Um, but yes, this is absolutely wonderful. And thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Kim, for, for taking time out of, out of your day. I know things are gonna be super hectic for you when the book comes out. Um, and we're all gonna do our part to make sure that it is back order, that everyone picks up a copy, um, even though then it'll be difficult for us to get even more, but <laughs> that happen. Um, but yeah, everyone, thank you so much for being here today. And I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you so much.